Well, um, it shows how maybe we don't pay attention when we go to Mass sometimes. But our next speaker and I actually go to the same parish, and we didn't know each other. So one of us is not showing up, apparently. But it, I'm sorry. I'm, it's a big church. So anyway, from just right down the road at St. Joe, right here in Springfield, I would like to introduce you to Alan Edwards. Good evening. Well, my name is Alan Edwards, and um, yeah, we do go to the same parish, and I haven't seen him before either, though. <laughs> I got the mic now. Uh, I had... Um, an interesting life. I've had two dreams as a little boy. I always wanted to be a police officer and I always wanted to be a singer. And uh, both of them dreams ironically became the true. Um, and this is how really it happened. Uh, in my family, my mom and dad, I had one brother, Douglas. He was seven years older than I and I was, I was the young one. And music was a big part of our family. We always played music together at reunions and gatherings and uh, we just enjoyed it so much. It was just part of us. And, but what wasn't a part of our family, when I look back now, and it saddens me, is that it was a foundation of faith. My family did not have that. Um, I can count on one hand how many times we went to church together as a family. And um, as the scripture says, it says, unless you build your home on a strong foundation, Build it on that rock, when the storms of life come, it just can't withstand. And my mom and dad's marriage was no exception. After several years, they ended up in a divorce. And it was really hard on my brother and I, especially me, because I was still living at home. My brother had moved out by this time. And uh, I went and stayed with my mom, and we became like best friends, I remember that. And mom was real supportive of my music, too. She would take me out. I remember we trolled one time to Sandusky, Ohio. I play guitar too, but I'm a vocalist mostly. mostly. But she, uh, we went to Sandusky, Ohio for a competition I was in, and I remember I read a road map for her. I was about nine years old, and we got there safely all the way from Hammond, Indiana. By the way, that's where I'm from. I'm a, I'm a convert in faith, and I'm a convert in football too. So Chiefs fans know I'm with you, okay? That was for you. But you know, uh, Music, though, always was my desire. Uh, when I graduated from high school, I, I took a job at a steel mill in northwest Indiana to support my music at night. I'd put together some bands and groups. We were going out and performing wherever we could get a gig. And then at the same time all this was going on, I, I met a beautiful lady. Her name was Jerry Lynn. And we fell in love, and we got married very, very young. Uh, she was 17, just turned 18, I believe. and. Uh, we continued on, she was a beautician, and so I continued on singing at night wherever I get a booking, and then I would also work at the daytime, and uh, I could tell after a while, I just could not launch this music career in Indiana. Now, I had some friends that moved out that time in Los Angeles, California, and there was a lot happening in LA in the music field, and I made a brilliant strategy. What I decided to do is, Jerry, since she had a job as a beautician in Indiana, I packed up and I moved out to L.A. to really go after my career in the music industry. Not a good decision for a young couple, right? But I was after that dream. But let me tell you, those days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months. Month after month after month went by, and every road I went down was a dead end. Every turn I made was a rejection. And by the time I made a decision to move back to Indiana, try to regroup because I was dead broke. Jerry and I had drifted apart because we were apart for so long. We were so young. And I remember when we talked, when I got back to Indiana, I really think I could have saved us then if I would have had a foundation under me that had that strength and that, that rock to stand on, but I didn't have it either. And I remember I, I gave her a hug and she packed the car up and when she drove away, that was one of the darkest hours of my life, and I wept. And that's uh, when I decided to change my direction again. I stayed in Indiana just a short period of time, but because of those heartaches, I packed up and I moved when I got enough money, and I went to Houston, Texas to pursue my other dream as a little boy, and I was become a police officer, and I became one. 
a Houston police officer. I actually ended my career in law enforcement as a detective. And uh, they were good to me. They found out uh, also that I could sing, so they start having me sing at special events for the police department, put me on ABC television and uh, other network programs. And it was a great honor for me working for the police department. And what I did at night, my extra job, because coppers got to have extra work, that's the way it is. Uh, I put together a country band down there and I started going in some of those big country halls. You imagine, I'm down in Houston, Texas. And I was singing places like Gillies. I remember when I first tried to get bookings, I'd go into those clubs and I'd say, hey, I got a really good band here. You guys uh, just enjoy it, I guarantee you. They said, we're booked pretty solid. I thought about it for a moment and I showed them my badge and gun. I said, well, you won't get robbed. Needless to say, we were a busy band. So I kept them two careers going. And then, uh, what happened to me then, um, is God started working in my life. It was working the streets of Houston as an officer. A lot of the young people that we had arrested for various crimes, I'd find out in an investigation that the majority came from a broken home, 95% of them. They either didn't have a father or a mother. In many cases, they didn't have both. And who was waiting in the shadows? Predators. And they'd lure these young people in with money and shelter, maybe just attention. And before they knew it, these young people were wrapped up in a, a world of crime, prostitution, drugs, auto theft rings, you name it. And a lot of them end up in prison or even worse. But needless to say, this was having a powerful effect on this man. But God was just getting started with Alan. There was a man that moved next door to me. His name was Rick Sabato. I lived in a townhome project in Southwest Houston. And uh, he was an engineer, traveled all around the world. A brilliant man and fascinating to talk to. And we became really good friends. And he was Catholic. And he would tell me a lot about Catholicism because I knew nothing. I really didn't know a lot about religion. But he would share a lot with me, and it was really getting my interest. It really was. And uh, I remember I asked him one day, and I was talking about me as an officer, what I was seeing on the streets of Houston, and my failure as a husband. And he said, uh, I just want to find the truth, Rick. He said, Alan, my suggestion is get a Bible and read it. You read it yourself, and then pray while you're reading it. So I did. I found a little Bible, and uh, I called my best friend, and I read that Bible, and I took about two months, and I just studied, and the more I read, the more I wanted to read. And after I got enough, I thought, here, and here maybe, I decided to go out and find the church. Now, I have to tell you, the Catholic Church was the last one I went to, because of some of our family members, they were pretty anti-Catholic, even though a lot of them didn't go to church. But it was St. Thomas More on Hillcroft Street in Houston, Texas. I walked in, I stepped into the church, I didn't sit down. I just went and I stood in the back and I observed. The first thing I observed, I remember, was the kneelers, the people kneeling. How it moved me in my heart and my soul. I had never seen it before. Of course, I've never been in a Catholic church before. And then the other thing that I just drew attention to right away was the crucifix right here. And I was just glued to the cross of our Lord. Then I listened to the homily, but when Father got to the Mass, that's when everything happened to me. When he said those words and blessed the bread and wine, he said, this is my body, take this all of you and eat and do this in memory of me. Then he held up the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant that will be shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. It was like, my eyes just opened up and scriptures started to come into life to me. Scales fell off my eyes. It was just an unbelievable feeling. I said, then all of a sudden I thought, all the scriptures that I had read came to life immediately. Scriptures about Peter, and about marriage, and I said to myself, I am standing in Holy Mother Church right now. I was so excited when I left, I remember I went home and I went to see my neighbor Rick, and I went and told him my experience and he just smiled. <laughs> 
He said, Alan, he said, there's a church I think you should go visit and a priest. I think they'll really help you continue your journey. The church was Holy Name Catholic Church in North Houston, very, very poor side of Houston, and I knew that town very well. He said, I just got a feeling. The address of this church was 1917 Cochran. Does that ring a bell, the year? The year of Fatima. I went to the church, and it was an old, old church, and I went to the back of the church. That's where I found Father, and he was feeding the poor back there, a whole line of people. I knew I was in the right place. After he got done feeding those wonderful souls, he came inside and took me to his office, a little humble office. It was 10 by 10 room. He had a little card-sized table with his Bible and rosary. He had a little chalkboard on the wall, I remember, and we talked. And I shared with him what I had experienced, and I told him I was hungry to learn more. And I told him about my failures, as a husband and also what I was seeing on the streets of Houston and he was so good to me and so gracious and he took me under his wings and began to start classes with me. But I remember him telling me this, he said, remember this, everything is possible with Christ, Alan, everything. You have to have faith. Well, after about two months went by, I finally got the courage to pick up the phone and call my wife back up in Hammond, Indiana, Jerry. And the conversation wasn't the best at first. But after another conversation, she did agree to meet with me because I had some pictures and some things that belonged to her that I wanted to return anyway. So I took a few days off from the Houston Police Department and I packed my bag and I headed from Houston to the Northwest Indiana, Hammond, Indiana. Anybody know where Hammond, Indiana is? A few of you do. Well. I remember pulling up to her apartment. It was a little one-bedroom apartment above this older home. And uh, I parked the car, and there was a long stairwell up to her apartment. And every step that I took, I was praying. And I said, God, it's in your hands. I knocked on the door, and it took her a moment to be able to get the door open. But when she pulled the door open, God opened up both of our hearts right then. And I can tell you that Jerry and I, we never left each other's side. We went to the classes together at the Catholic Church, and we got married in the Catholic Church together. And that was a big day for me. I had four sacraments in one day. I, <laughs> I was baptized, I had confirmation, first Eucharist, and I got married. Now that's a full day, folks. Well, I continued on with my job on the police department and also singing. And uh, then I met a man, uh, I was singing a special on for television and this man walked up to me. His name is Gabe Tucker and I'll never forget it. Uh, everybody knew him in Houston. He was very, very well known because he'd worked with many, many major recording artists. And he came up to me and said, son, you need to start recording music. And I've been doing a lot of music already, but I hadn't been in the studios yet and I knew he knew what he was talking about. His name was Gabe Tucker, and Gabe's the one that found Elvis Presley for Colonel Parker. He also was working with Eddie Arnold when I met him, and many, many other artists, uh, too many to list. And he took me into the studios, and he really taught me what it was to be a recording artist, and I'm glad he did, because it ended up being a song that would get me to Branson, Missouri, the live entertainment capital of the world. But before we get there, I gotta tell you this, that. Jerry and I, we were trying, while we were trying all this, we were trying to have a family. And we tried for five years to have children. Five. And the doctor said it probably wasn't possible. I think we did every test known to mankind. And I remember we came home from Mass one day and we knelt down together and we said a prayer together. We said, Lord, if it just be possible, could you bless her with a child? Ladies and gentlemen, in less than 30 days, she was carrying our first daughter, Mary. And then came Elizabeth, <laughs> then Magdalene, okay, Lord, then Bonnie, and then we had a son at the end, Alan Joshua, AJ. And uh, I'd like to say this moment right now, if I could, that's my lovely wife right back there, if you just give her a nice little applause. Thank you, honey. That's my best half. 
Well, we had our family growing, and then this is how I got to Branson. I recorded a song. I wanted a song about marriage because I had just experienced so much. And a wonderful writer, I've been blessed with great writers in my career, but he wrote this song for me called Could We Please Stay in Love for a While. It's a song about when things get tough, hang in there. It's important. And I recorded it, but I didn't release it in Houston. I took it up to Mountain Home. The reason why we went to Mountain Home, Arkansas, that's where her mom and dad retired. Every chance we got out of Houston, Texas to go to the Ozarks, we went. How could you blame me, right? I fell in love with the Ozarks. I mean, the hills, the lakes, the rivers, the golf. I love to golf. Anyway, I went there and it was on KTLO radio in Mountain Home, Arkansas. I took the song, Could Be Pleased, into them. I introduced myself, I gave them a business card, and they started playing it. And sure enough, it became their top requested song for weeks on end. Well, luck lucky for that because it caught on in Harrison, Arkansas. A lot of you know where that's at, right? And sure enough, Branson, Missouri got ear of it. And one day I was golfing and I, we got a call. They said, you got to come in and catch this call. It was from a radio station in Branson, Missouri. They said, is this your song? I said, yes, it is. They said, I tell you, we're getting a lot of calls for this. He said, would you mind coming up here and doing a showcase? I said, I think Branson would be good for you. They didn't have to twist my arm because I knew what was happening in Branson. This was the heyday. This was in the middle 90s through the 2000s when I came up. So I did the showcase and the rest was history. We fell in love with Branson. I got my own show. I performed 20 years in Branson, Missouri at our dinner theater called the Allen Edwards Dining Showroom. Got a lot of friends there. I did a lot of specials too with uh, Tony Orlando and I are big on veterans. And so we did a lot of programs together too. And uh, one night, though, I was coming home. It was such a busy time for us. I was doing three shows a day, six days a week in Branson. And I'd always call my father back in uh, Hillsboro, Illinois. That's where he retired. It's a little farming community north of St. Louis. You know where that's at. And on their county square, he was telling me about this. He said, we got this battle going on, son. He says, on our county square, we got a sign. It says, the world needs God. It's been there 63 years. That little farming community, they spent $160,000 of donated money from their community just to defend it. And I said, Dad, I don't think they're gonna win that. Well, he called me one day and they did lose that battle. The Chicago Supreme Court went against them and they tore the sign down. Well, I couldn't believe it. So what I did, I said, Dad, do you know where the sign is? He said, no, I don't. I said, well, we're going to find it. So I got a break from performing in Branson, and I hustled up there. And it took little detective skills, trust me, but I found it in a basement in the third level in a building there on the square in Hillsborough, Illinois. Now, all of this, what I'm telling you, is all on film, too. In my regular program, we show all this live to you folks, but we didn't have that ability here today. But I remember... I went downstairs and we turned on the lights. I had a camera with me and there was the sign, the world needs God, this huge sign laying in the floor in the debris with boards on top of it, broken glass shattered. The world needs God. And I had such a pit in my stomach. And I thought to myself right then, I said, you know what? When we get our break in August, which I do, I get about two weeks before we start the big fall campaign with all the motor coaches coming into town. I said, we're going to go to Washington, D.C. I had a good team. I had two wonderful film people that went with me. And I took off from Branson, Missouri to Washington, D.C. And I got the help from a wonderful man, the Speaker of the House, Mr. Newt Gingrich. We went into D.C. and I called also the Capitol Police Department. We got permission to take cameras in certain buildings. And again, you would see this in our regular program, but I went in and I couldn't believe what I found in Washington, D.C. You know, there's more official evidences of God in Washington, D.C. than any other city in this world. The words in God we trust are etched in marble as a backdrop behind the Speaker of the House of Representatives. 
At the top of the Washington Monument are the words, Praise be to God. Lying in the stairwell are several moving quotes. Search the scriptures, holiness to the Lord, and train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Numerous quotations I found in the halls of Library of Congress. One of them reads, The light that shineth in the darkness, but the darkness comprehendeth it not. A reading from John 1, 5. Moses, holding the Ten Commandments, is listed as one of the great lawgivers on the court's east front of the Supreme Court. And the crier who closes each Supreme Court session closes with the words, God save the United States and his honorable court. And our forefathers, they left us with hope and wisdom too. One great president said that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. And he continued, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And these are the words of President Abraham Lincoln. Another great president said, God who gave us life, he gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are a gift from God? The president said, indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, but his justice cannot sleep forever. And ladies and gentlemen, these are the words of President Thomas Jefferson, and I can tell you they are etched in stone in Washington, D.C. But the room that got me was the Capitol building. They have a small room for prayer for members of Congress. And the whole focal point of this room is a stained glass window of our very first president, George Washington, and he's kneeling in prayer. And etched behind our president are the words from Psalm 16:1, Preserve me, O God, it's for in thee do I put my trust. Ladies and gentlemen, history is already proven that no nation, no matter how powerful or wealthy, can stand without placing its feet firmly upon the foundation of God's truth. We are founded upon in God we trust. I remember when I came home, I made a decision then that I would do my best to help spread this message. We have a great country, the United States of America, ladies and gentlemen. We really do. We just got to hold on to her. Even in the songs that we sing for this nation, we glorify God's holy name. So just to kind of sum up, because I know I'm at 2.30, two, two right? <laughs> just to kind of sum up this, though, I uh, think Hillsborough had it right. The world needs God. It's not just the world. We need God. Our families need God. Our marriages need God. Our schools need God. And our workplaces need God. This country, the United States of America, needs God. And before I close, I do want to share this with you. My love and affection for Mary happened this way. Like I said, I'm a convert. I never had that real personal relationship with Mary until what happened to me. It's when I got COVID and I had it really, really severe. Mine attacked me, not in my chest, it attacked me in my throat. What I'd use to sing and to talk with, right? But I was having a difficult time breathing, swallowing. It was terrifying, it was. And my worst day was on August 16th. I was such with fever. And the reason why I remember that date, because that was the anniversary of my mother's death. And I was missing her, thinking of her. And God helped me. I opened up the scriptures and started reading, and he took me right to Genesis. And I looked down and it said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed. He will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. He took me to the wedding at Cana. And Mary looked at her son and said, they have no more wine. 
And Jesus said, woman, again, woman, it's not my time. Then Mary said, of course, to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Then, my Lord, I opened up the scripture and I went right to the cross at John. And Jesus looked down from the cross at his mother. And again, he said, woman, behold your son. Then he said to John, the disciple, he loved John, behold your mother. And both of them were said with an exclamation mark. So he said it with whatever ability and force he could in the condition he was in. And that's the moment that God just opened my eyes and I felt the love and presence of my mother, Mary, Mary. right there. It all happened. There's something about a mother's love that's different. It's so unconditional. We all know that, don't we? Moms are different. And I felt this mother's love on me. And I gave her my heart. 